Hello, I'm Nito Cobain. Welcome to Side by Side. My guest today has invested his life in the world of real estate and more. From humble beginnings as a home builder in North Carolina to owning a company that has built homes across America. He is also deeply committed to causes like finding a cure for type 1 diabetes. We're talking real estate development and serving the healthcare needs of our communities and a lot more with Mr. Roy Carroll. Funding for Side by Side with Nito Cobain is made possible by... Here's to those that rise and shine, to friendly faces doing more than their part, and to those who still enjoy the little things. You make it feel like home. Ashley Home Store. This is home. The Bud Group is a company of everyday leaders making a difference by providing facility solutions through customized janitorial, landscape, and maintenance services. Coca-Cola Consolidated is honored to make and serve 300 brands and flavors locally. Thanks to our teammates. We are Coca-Cola Consolidated, your local bottler. Roy Carroll, welcome to Side by Side. People in North Carolina and beyond know your name, know what you've done. You've come from humble beginnings and you've built a humongous business, business building homes, you started that way, now apartments and many other endeavors too. Mm -hmm. But here's what fascinates me, with all of your business endeavors, mm -hmm. You actually race Ferrari. <laughs> yes. Roy, why? I'm terrible at golf. <laughs> <laughs> so I was looking for a hobby and an outlet to do something, and uh, I've been collecting Ferraris for a number of years and everything, and I was out track one day, and this team down in Charlotte saw me, and they needed a driver, and so one thing led to another. You're literally the driver. I, I'm actually the driver, yes. Now, it was a lot of coaching. <laughs> With all the things going on in your life, you were willing to take that risk. Yes, I, I, you know, I, I think it's dangerous on a golf course too. I know I have a lot of friends that have, you know, tore rotator cuffs and everything else <laughs> yes. on a tennis court or a golf course. So, it's uh, it's fairly safe and everything. We have all the protection that, uh, just like the NASCAR. How do you guys find do. the time to do that? Well, it's uh, you know, you have to make time for the things that you have passion for. Yeah. And so. Uh, it's a great group of people. I love to meet new people, and it's been a great outlet because most of the people that are racing in the series I'm racing, they're, they're independent business people, and each of them have a unique story. You know, Roy, I've known you a long time, and I've admired your, your uh, success and significance path in life. You started with very humble beginnings. Uh, you, you and your dad were building some homes, and, uh, but your dad certainly was not a person of great means, mm -hmm. if I may say so. Right. Uh, and yet you went on to expand your business, not only in North Carolina, but literally across the country. I know of investments you have in Bozeman, Montana, and in Texas, and Florida, mm -hmm. and beyond. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of courage to do that, mm -hmm. because inherent in much of what you do is risk. Mm -hmm. How do you handle risk? Well, you know, I, I tell our staff that every day my job is to wake up and, and, and manage risk to reward. And, uh, you know, we've always tried to put our own capital into, into projects and borrow the minimal amount possible. And uh, we don't have outside investors or equity partners. I tell people I'm, I'm always fearful of losing someone else's money, so it's our money. And uh, we just invest in projects that we can afford. We don't get a, in front of our skis, so to speak. But how do you do that? Ed educate us, please. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at an opportunity, what right. are the fundamentals you look at? Well, we look at, of course, return on investment. That's the main thing. We look at markets that are, that are growing and expanding. You know, uh, our, our primary business is multifamily, garden-style apartments. We do some, some wrap-up apartments and mid-rise apartments. But we're looking for young populations, uh, that affluent job-creating uh, communities, uh, such as Austin, Texas, Nashville, Tennessee, South Florida, uh, RTP here, uh, Charlotte, those kind of markets where there are opportunities for young people and also recreational outlets. You know, today, as we all know, I've got three daughters who are in their 20s and 30s, and uh, they want to live where there are opportunities for not just work, but also opportunities for recreational outlets. Mm -hmm. You said Austin and Charlotte and, and South Florida and Bozeman, Montana. Right, right. 
Why Bozeman, Montana? Well, we were going out there skiing, and you know, I, I decided to get in the car and ride around and see what rents were in the market. And I was I was impressed with the amount of uh, uh, apartments that were in the market compared to the number of people, influx of people, young people moving in that market. And and it's uh, what they call a zoom town. Uh, uh, we all have heard of boom towns, but zoom towns is post COVID where people, especially like engineers, architects, young people like that, can live, work wherever they want to. And so why not live in a Bozeman of the world where you can work during the day, put a pair of skis on, go skiing in the afternoon? Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting that you have been able to anticipate opportunity. Right. Would, you, would you agree with that statement that you, that you are not necessarily a follower, you're a leader, you see an opportunity? An example would be uh, you built all of these... Uh, I'm not sure what you would call them, but storage. Mm -hmm. I call them storage buildings. What do you call them? Well, it's self-storage. Yeah, self-storage. And, um, and you see, you see them all over the country. But what we did is we stu we studied the self-storage industry. We thought it'd be a good sister company to our multifamily business. And uh, there, you know, there's a lot of good builders out there, developers of self-storage product, and a lot of national companies are competing against. So. What we didn't want to do is we didn't want to be a commodity. You never want to be a commodity in life regardless of what you're doing. And so we decided we wanted to be the up, upper scale, uh, upper end brand. So we worked on this concept for about three and a half years and uh, a lot of whiteboard ideas and names and stuff. We came up with Be Safe Storage. And uh, one of the things that we do to help set us apart is our architecture. Um, you know, we, we invest about a million dollars extra in the architecture uh, facade versus what most of our competitors do. We have the wine storage. It's kind of a loss leader a little bit, but that helps brand us as upper tier. And so it's, it's been a really good brand for us. We have 41 stores across the Southeast and in Montana currently, and uh, we're looking to really uh, put more capital to that business and expand it. Do you build those in places that are uh, close to apartment holdings or it doesn't matter? It doesn't really matter, but it, uh, you know, if we're already traveling to Nashville's of the world and Austin's and Dallas and South Florida, we might as well, you know, for multifamily, we might as well have some self storage mm -hmm. here too for our team to travel. Mm -hmm. to. How does Roy Carroll come up with an idea? Uh, I, I look around and I study things. Um, and typically it's not a, a, a unique idea. It's a, it's an idea that someone else may have already come up with, but you know, we put a variation on it, or we put a, a number of ideas together and try to try to make something that's unique and different. What does your day look like, Roy? Do you get up early in the morning, and mm -hmm. do, you, do you think in the morning and write ideas down? Uh, and what uh, what point do you mm -hmm. stop at night? Just because, as long as I've known you, you are um, a healthy person mm -hmm. and a, and a, and a health conscious person. Mm -hmm. You exercise. You take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And yet, from the outside looking in, mm -hmm. you have a highly engaged career, mm -hmm. very intense business mm -hmm. uh, involvement, and usually those most people don't balance those perfectly mm -hmm. well. You take time off, you mm -hmm. take with your family here and yonder. So give us an idea of what your day looks like. Well, first of all, I'm married to a very good woman, as you know, yes. and uh, she's, she's a big part of the team, so she manages you know, all the household stuff and have for, for years and years. And she's always been very supportive of my career and, and our business that we've grown together. But, um, you know, I'm pretty much working. If I'm, if I'm awake, I'm, I'm working. I may be uh, skiing, I may be riding a bike, but I'm thinking about business. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've had to deal with for years is ADD, which can be, you know, it can be tough to deal with, especially in the early years when I was in school <laughs> trying to deal with it. But it's, it's, I've, I've learned how to harness it. And so now I can, I can be doing a couple things at one time. Uh, maybe not great, but I have people around me that can <laughs> make mm -hmm. sure that things are executed well. But uh, yeah, so I'm constantly making lists, coming up with ideas. If I see something, I'll take a photo, I'll, I'll jot down notes and uh, constantly look for the next venture. So you had ADD as a child? Yes, sir. How did you, what, 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 what was the turning point? At what point did you uh, take this ADD a disadvantage, shall we call it, and turn it into a benefit? Well, I think it was high school, college. Um, when I went to school, my father was a meat cutter, grocery store guy, as you know, and, you know, it wasn't for means, as, as, as you stated. And uh, when I went to college, it was expensive. And so I decided I needed to really buckle down and try to stay. And I was just having a real hard time. And when I was in uh, elementary school, you know, the school tested me and everything. said, we, we don't think, we think he's halfway intelligent. 
And they called my mom in and said, uh, he needs more structure. And my mom on a statement, she said, I'm spanking him so much now, my arm is tired all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyways, uh, you know, they really didn't diagnose ADD, yes, you know, yes. uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And I'm, I'm also really cautious about talking about non-medication of ADD because it's a spectrum. Yes. And so, you know, I was able to harness that and get by without medication, but there may be another young person that needs medication. Sure. So I'm always real guarded about talking right. about too much about that. But um, in, in college, I realized I needed to really figure out how to study, how mm -hmm. to learn, comprehend things, and focus. And so uh, that's helped me. And that's one thing about auto racing. I can't be sitting there texting, thinking about five other things. I'm thinking about how to get through that next turn without <laughs> yeah. crashing my car. <laughs> yes, absolutely, yes. And so, so um, from my observational perspective, a lot of what you do has risk inherent in it. Mm -hmm. uh, quite often you can run the business perfectly, but there are external risks. There right. is uh, the Great Recession of 08, 09, most disrupted economic times in the last 90 years of America's history. Mm -hmm. There is a pandemic that comes along that mm -hmm. maybe keeps people from doing this or that. There are external risks that enter into the businesses that you're in. Mm -hmm. You must have a formula that you follow beyond just, I measure risk and reward, I measure return investment. W what are the risk f questions that you ask yourself? For example, mm -hmm. you ask yourself questions like, uh, uh, if, what is the worst thing that can happen in this particular endeavor? Mm -hmm. And how might I deal with it? And right. I, if I can't deal with it, I'll walk. Mm -hmm. what, 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 is your, what is your technique for managing mm -hmm. risks? Well, it's exactly that. Uh, from, from day one, um, you know, when my father and I started the business, we put money back in the business. And, and money is kind of our insurance. Capital is our insurance policy. And so that allows us to get through the next recession. And it's not if there's a next recession, it's when there's a next recession. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you know, just from day one when we started. You're not predicting anything. You're just we're not predicting. suggesting we know. that historically this happens. Exactly. We yeah. know historically that the economy goes through various yeah. cycles. And we need, to have, we need to have capital on the sidelines to weather those storms. And, and we do ask ourselves that exact question. Can we weather the next storm? And a lot of developers, I tell people, developers are the most optimistic people you ever meet. Mm. You know, if it's good, it's going to get better, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's how, that's how we've managed the storms is, you know, we're, we don't do more than we can afford mm -hmm. in worst case scenarios. What was the biggest mistake you've made and what did you learn from it? Uh, I think some, one of the worst mistakes I've made probably is, is not... Uh, mentoring to enough young people and stuff in our organization to grow them. And so the last, coaching your own team. Coaching friends. our own people. And, um, and we've had some really good people years ago that I, uh, that I wish I had spent more time with, but I was out trying to figure out the mm -hmm. next deal. So today we really have an internal program to try mm -hmm. to mentor to. We've brought mm -hmm. a lot of really smart, hardworking young people on board. And uh, we've got a great workforce, which allows me to do some of those things we yes. were talking about and yeah. not work so hard uh, managing the day to day. Mm -hmm. I want to be the ideas guy. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I really enjoy doing, getting out of bed in the morning, figuring out what's our next endeavor. Uh, but uh, you know, we're a fairly large organization now and there's a lot of day to day uh, things that need to be mm -hmm. taken care of. And I've got people now that can handle that. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest business mistake you made? Did uh, you lose money in a, in a deal um, uh, in a significant way? And how did you recover from that? Mm -hmm. Well, there's been opportunities that we didn't pursue that uh, I, can, I can That's point lost, to. That's lost opportunity. Lost yes. opportunity. But as far as losing money, we've been really fortunate over the years that we've, you know, with, with the uh, ability to wait out a deal. Maybe the deal's not, it doesn't, it doesn't pan out the first year or two. Um, an example is we did uh, uh, a large condo project in uh, 06, start 06, and the recession hit in 07. And uh, my father was still alive. He passed away in 08, and he asked me, he said, son, that's a big, this is a big condo tower. Mm -hmm. He said, can you afford the worst case scenario, which we talked about? And I said, yes, we can. And we had people lined up fighting over the condos, basically. And the economy turned, and it was nothing that we did. You know, we had the right, we had the right location, we had the right people, right plans, just lousy timing. And my business, it, you can have all those ingredients mm. and just the wrong timing. We had the capital, we weathered the storm, and, uh, you know, it took us a number of years. Um, we didn't give it back to the bank. We could have, um, but we said we're going to do the right thing. We paid off the loan completely on the building and, uh, 
you know, it's, uh, it, we didn't make any money on it, but we did the right thing. And now you're in the hotel business? Right. Why? Uh, one of my daughters has a passion. She has a master's degree in hotel hospitality. She has a passion for it. It's a tough business today. You know, we're having a hard time finding workers. We're taking rooms offline uh, because we, we can't turn them and, and get them in the shape they need to be in. But we have, we have four other hotel projects we're working on now. And I think that industry will come back. It, uh, it won't come back the way it was pre-COVID. But uh, I definitely think there's opportunities for hotels in the right locations. I read somewhere where you're doing a big project in Wilmington, North Carolina. Right. Are you willing to talk about it? Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a resort um, uh, convention uh, hotel. It's a big Westin. It's a $250 million hotel, multifamily retail uh, endeavor. And we've been studying it, working on it, and uh, we hope to break ground sometime in the next uh, 90 days, actually. Mm -hmm. And it would take a couple of years? It would take a couple of years to build that out. Yes, sir. Roy, as you, um, as you engage on your team younger people, mm -hmm. what are the three qualities you look for in a new employee? Well, we, we call it the Carroll Company's three-legged stool. The first one's honesty and integrity. You know, I've, I like to be around people that I can trust. And it's a two-way street. You know, mm -hmm. trust starts at the top. I can't be saying we're going to do this guy wrong in this deal and tell them, guys, you need to do what's right. So they watch me and, and uh, we try to bring on people that, that have uh, a, a large degree of honesty and integrity. The next is uh, God-given intelligence. I can't make you smarter than what you are. <laughs> I've tried to make people smarter, but I, I, you know, I'm not smart enough to make people smarter. And the third thing is just motivation. You know, we, we look for people that want to be there in the mornings. You know? Initiative. They, they, want, they want to be with our organization. They want mm. to be a part of a team. You notice I didn't say anything about skill set because we're not building rocket engines. You know, we're putting sticks and bricks together. So we can teach you the skill set. If you've got those three traits, you know, you're probably gonna do well at the Carroll companies. Mm -hmm. And um, turnover? Turnover, um, you know, one of, our, one of our issues is we are, you know, the good thing is we've expanded geographically. The other thing is uh, some of these, some of these uh, regional offices that we have that are kind of remote from the mothership, it's hard to, to kind of uh, uh, convey uh, the passion, the, the drive, uh, the synergy that we have from the, the main office. At, right, at mm -hmm. the Carroll Company. So, you know, with COVID, that's been really difficult. We've been doing some video um, uh, uh, messages that we send out, but still that's not warm like myself sitting down or a senior management team sitting down with a group of young people in, a, in an Austin office or something like that. So. Uh, now that, uh, you know, vaccinations rolling out and everything else, we're trying to do more travel and uh, hopefully uh, we can do a better job with that. Mm -hmm. where, where do you find you get your courage? It takes a lot of courage to do mm -hmm. what you're doing. It takes a lot mm -hmm. of faith, a lot of courage, mm -hmm. a lot of faithful courage. Where mm -hmm. does that emanate from? Well, as you know, my faith is, is important to me. And then, like I said previously, I've, I've got a good supporting wife and family and uh, you know, I know at the end of the day, if, if I don't have a dollar to my name, I'm, I'm still going to have that loving family. And uh, my wife may not be too happy with me, but <laughs> she's still going to be there. And uh, just, just the reliance on my faith, I think, has been a big mm -hmm. part of, of who I am. And you have been very active in the JDRF, mm -hmm. the juvenile uh, diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, what, what got you interested in that? Well, unfortunately, uh, again, we were out skiing uh, out west, and my, my oldest daughter was 12 at the time, and she uh, acted like she had the flu, kind of, you know. Uh, and uh, so we took her to a doctor and did blood tests and come to find out she had type 1 diabetes. Well, I didn't know that much about type 1 diabetes. So I get online. You know, I'm a father builder. I can, I can fix this, right? So I'm, I'm online, and there is no cure for diabetes today. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I reached out to uh, uh, JDRF, the organization that one of the organizations helps uh, support find a cure for diabetes, and uh, made a donation right there in the hotel room. And she was in intensive care for three days in, uh, in, uh, out west. And so uh, they contacted me, and we've been involved ever since. Uh, we've done some things to raise money, such as we build a house uh, annually and donate the proceeds to JDRF. Uh, we've been very, uh, uh, very involved in the walks and the galas and such. And uh, so we're, we're trying to do what we can. And there's been a lot of great strides. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's still a disease today that uh, uh, she has to deal with daily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, as you um, look towards the future, mm -hmm. w what is it you're thinking about? Just more of the same, or is there something big on that whiteboard that you are mm -hmm. that you are dreaming about cooking and analyzing? Mm -hmm. Well, from a business perspective, um, you know, again, continue to manage, mentor to my senior management team, uh, continue to remove myself from day-to-day -day operations and be more, my ultimate goal is to lay myself off and I'm more the ideas guy over here on the side and, and the senior management team is running the day-to-day -day operations. From a personal perspective, um, I'd like to, you know, I've got this kind of dream of, of doing something, you know, we're in boating a bit and maybe doing something with boats and some kind of relief, uh, uh, missions relief or something like mm -hmm. that where areas that are devastated by natural disasters. Mm -hmm. Roy, uh, you have been exceptionally successful in many, many ways and you're doing good work and we all thank you for that. And you've been very involved in economic development mm -hmm. in certainly in North Carolina and certainly in the region in which you reside, the Triad region. Um, you're a young man uh, by, you know, by uh, age-wise. You've got a lot of years ahead of you. But how is it that you want to be remembered by your children first and by society at large? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want my children to remember me as a, as a man that was, was an honest man and uh, was involved in his community to make his community a better place and took care of his fellow mankind to the best of his ability. Um, you know, if, if I'm remembered like that, I'm, I'll, I'll be I'll be pleased um, by the by the community. Um, you know, I want to I want to make my community a better place. Uh, uh, and my community is you know the whole country. So, uh, you know, job creation, trying to figure out one of the things I'm passionate about also is is affordable housing, and uh, you know that's uh, yeah, that that's a that's a real struggle mm -hmm. right now across the country. And so that's something I'd like to figure out. And some of our folks on our team's trying to work through that question. And we're meeting a lot with the representatives of both on the federal level, state level, and local levels on affordable housing issues. Mm -hmm. What scares you the most? Uh, from a business perspective, uh, uh, s supply chain issues, labor issues. And, and you know, every, every situation uh, that occurs has, has a counter. And one of the things right now is, you know, we're talking about labor, you know, in the context of today, labor shortages and such. And all my friends that own businesses, manufacturing business, different types of business are looking at automation. So what happens in five, 10 years from now? Are there going to be jobs available if everybody's investing in automation because they can't get employees today? Automation or outsourcing. Uh, That's right. Outsourcing, offshore. you know, artificial intelligence, a big part of that too. And so the, the concern is, are there going to be jobs in five to 10 years when, when, you know, that really starts to take hold mm -hmm. even more so than what we've seen it. I mm -hmm. think I think that's on a, a, a very big upward trajectory. So uh, short term, you know, it's a supply chain issues that uh, everybody's facing today. We we have a supply chain issue of the week. I mean, it's something that, that we're short on. Uh, one of the ingredients it takes to make a hotel or make an apartment community or housing development. So yes. we're just dealing with that real time. Yeah. And um, you, you, you engage a lot of young people in your business, mm -hmm. uh, college-educated uh, young people as you grow. Uh, what is it that you think colleges ought to be doing more to prepare mm -hmm. uh, graduates for this competitive, mm -hmm. ever-expanding global marketplace in which we all mm -hmm. reside? Yeah. Well, one of the things I've been really pleased to see in the last, I guess, 10 years or so is more and more colleges put emphasis on internships. and we. We typically have a half a dozen or so interns in our main office, and I think that that is so valuable to these young people because uh, one, they're investing a lot of money to learn a skill for a particular. A lot of times, it's a very focused particular position they think they want, and and I've seen interns come in before and spend a little bit of time and say, hey. I really don't want to do that. I'd rather do something over here. So before you invest too much money, I think internships. And so I, I really like the direction that most colleges, universities are going today, requiring internships, mentorships, and stuff like that. And I'm very supportive of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the main, the main thing about college graduates, they have to have an understanding of life skills, right? They, right. You know, you don't want to hire somebody and then spend two years trying to train them and educate them and, uh, um, to do their job well, but right. rather that they have some acknowledgement, understanding of the business world and what they must do to be successful. Um, so 
Uh, how many apartments in all that you've built over the years? Well, we've got about 14,000 on the ground today, and we've got another 4,000 in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And four or five hotel projects that you've got going right. on, and 60, 70 of these uh, self self uh, storage right, right. units. Mm -hmm. And um, as you look for the tomorrows of Roy Carroll, your biggest wish is what? Well, my biggest wish is we continue to grow. Uh, we don't want to be necessarily the largest for largest sake. We want to be a good company, a solid company that mm -hmm. again, we're growing our, our people internally. Well, you're certainly doing a great job. You're, you're, you're the American dream personified, Roy. You know, you came from very meager beginnings and you built a very substantial business. And now you're using your resources and your connections to make our world a better place. We thank you for that. And I especially thank you for being side by side with me here on this program today. Thank you. Funding for Side by Side with Nito Cobain is made possible by... Here's to those that rise and shine, to friendly faces doing more than their part, and to those who still enjoy the little things. You make it feel like home. Ashley Home Store. This is home. The Bud Group is a company of everyday leaders making a difference by providing facility solutions through customized janitorial, landscape, and maintenance services. Coca-Cola Consolidated is honored to make and serve 300 brands and flavors locally. Thanks to our teammates. We are Coca-Cola Consolidated, your local bottler.